Good morning again. Uh, this is Gary Morris again. As uh, you undoubtedly know, um, we had tremendous problems with the uh, hardware when I gave this lecture last week. So this is a repeat of that lecture. Um, the executive summary is on your screen and I'll give you just a moment to look at it. I don't own a cat, but uh, I believe that this bit of wisdom from the, the Holland Sentinel is probably true. Well, let's get into uh, AI update part two. As you'll recall, last week, we defined five basic types of artificial intelligence. Uh, natural language processing, which has several subcategories. Machine learning, which turns out to be uh, the hero of our story computer vision, planning and decision-making, and robotics. Now, today, we're going to look at all the issues concerning artificial intelligence in our society. I've broken them into three basic categories of economic issues, social issues, and legal issues. The first economic issue is simply the cost of deep learning. As you heard last week, machine learning, and especially the form of it called deep learning, is turning out to be a very, very powerful tool for almost every type of AI. But the problem is that machine learning has become very effective only since huge nets have become feasible. We're talking about tens of billions of parameters. Those nets are so large that it takes a very large computer with a lot of memory even to process them, and the amount of computer time and energy required is considerable. The Analytics India magazine has said that the cost of training a neural net with just one and a half billion, <laughs> just one and a half billion parameters, is between 80,000 and 1.6 million. Well, that might seem like a small number to some, but Amazon Web Services and others offer net training in the cloud, so no hardware purchases are needed. We're talking about simply rental time on a large computer. None of that cost is the cost of equipment. Now, do you remember we showed you GPT-3 last week, that amazing story generator? You give it one sentence like Bob was frightened by the loud sound, and it generates this whole story, which is almost in the style of, uh, of an old fashioned uh, horror story. Well, the cost of training GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters, was $12 million for a single training run. And again, that's no hardware cost. That's simply the, the fee paid to Amazon Web Services for that much computer time. It seems that uh, amazing capabilities only come at amazing costs. Who can afford this? Innovation, in our society at least, often comes from startups with new ideas. But if machine learning is a tool that only the big boys can afford, is the cost stifling innovation? Now, some open source research labs perform this expensive work and then give away the results. And that is one way of dealing with this very high cost. For instance, GPT-3 was produced by an organization called OpenAI. It paid for all the cost of development and then it provides the outcome and the source code for free. Also, some researchers are seeking ways to cut the costs. Um, Google's uh, research lab in London called DeepMind has a new language model that can beat others 25 times its size, they claim. Now, if uh, size is proportionate to cost, that means that maybe their language model could cut the cost of one training run for GPT-3 from 12 million to maybe a half million. That's still a little too rich for my blood, but a lot of organizations could afford that. Also, government has often funded expensive research for the common good. 
Now, DARPA's AI Next program, this is their logo that you see, is a $2 billion multi-year program which is aiming only to provide funding for fundamental research to improve the capabilities in AI and to cut the cost. So there may be some answers to the cost of deep learning. Another economic issue is simply the impact of AI and robotics on human employment. Indeed, um, more and more companies are asking the questions, why should we hire humans? If you'll look at the uh, picture in the lower left, you'll notice that those robots are performing part of the assembly of an automobile. Before any of that automation occurred in 1950, the population of Detroit was 1.85 million. Last year, 639,000. That is largely the result, both direct and indirect, of automation in the auto industry. It is a real issue. Now, automation is nothing new. Uh, in effect, you could argue that automation began when the steam engine was enveloped. But the pace of automation seems to be accelerating. That's the problem. And of course, it is perhaps accelerated even more by what they are calling the great resignation. During COVID-19, a lot of employees decided that they did not need a job or it was just too difficult to work and try to take care of children who were home because the schools were closed. This has produced a severe shortage of human labor and that's one more pressure on employers to buy machines instead of hiring people. And let's face it, those machines are increasingly capable and growing cheaper every year. And intelligent machines can do more kinds of work than they used to. All these pressures are leading in one direction. Now, the example that we're probably most familiar with is self-driving cars. Uh, this has proven to be a lot tougher program than anybody expected, but self-driving vehicles are gonna get there. It's happening slowly, but it will happen. Uh, especially with trucks, because trucks often follow standard routes and oftentimes do almost all their driving on limited access highways. That's one of the easiest driving jobs that there is. Well, currently, there's a shortage of 60,000 truck drivers just in the USA. This is an additional tremendous pressure to automate. But 25% of all American jobs are drivers truck drivers, taxi drivers, delivery drivers, Uber drivers, you name it. 25% of all Americans earn their living by driving. And that task is being automated. As you may recall, this is what Waymo, Google's self-driving division, is using in Phoenix to provide driverless taxi rides to people who are part of their test group in Phoenix. If you call for a ride using their app, you may very well see one of these cars show up with no one in the driver's seat and no safety engineer in the passenger seat. They are operating completely autonomously. Uh, this is a graph that was produced shortly after the financial crisis of 2008, and it only covers two years. But it shows that even as we were recovering from the great financial crisis, when in effect, uh, jobs were, were hard to come by and people really couldn't demand much in the way of uh, wages, still total compensation costs were rising while the cost of equipment and software was dropping. I don't think anyone believes that those curves have changed their shape in recent years. People are getting more and more expensive. Machines are becoming less expensive. This is a flyer that was produced by a company that was trying to uh, sell a $500,000 machine to a particular company. Now that machine could do the work that normally would take three manual laborers, but that machine can work 24 seven. So they pointed out that if you buy their machine, you get rid of three manual laborers for three shifts, that's nine people. They can be replaced with just one person 
who keeps the machine running. In addition, and this is the important part, they pointed out that if you eliminate human employees, you eliminate a lot of additional costs. Employee turnover, which is certainly a, a realistic factor, uh, workplace injuries, absenteeism, um, mistakes that can ruin product. All told, they believed that their sales pitch for a half million dollar machine boiled down to one number. You buy our machine for a half million dollars and it'll pay for itself in less than a year and a half. What company can afford to ignore those kinds of savings? Because the machines work 24 seven. In effect, there are more and more factories in the United States that are operating in what they call lights out mode. There are no lights on in the factory for at least two shifts because there are no people and the machines don't need any lights. And one technician can support multiple machines. Plus, it's just a more interesting job. So the question is, will humans suffer greatly from technological employment? Well, it depends. Now, the sudden loss of 25% of jobs is what we experienced in the Great Depression. At the depths of the Great Depression, the unemployment rate was only 25%, but that happened suddenly within one year. On the other hand, we've experienced the loss of 90% of jobs over a long period of time, and that wasn't a problem, that was social progress. This is a graph showing agricultural employment in the United States from the year 1800 to approximately the year 2000. Now you'll notice that the top graph showing the number of employees had a bit of a peak around 1900 because the population of the United States was growing very rapidly. But if you look at the lower graph, that's the percentage of US workers who were involved in agriculture. It was almost 80% in 1800. And currently it is way less, way less than 5%. So this was a loss of over 90% of all the agricultural jobs, but it wasn't a problem because we had time. Slowing the pace of automation actually allows time for redeployment and retraining of the workers. When all those agricultural workers left the countryside, they went to the cities where suddenly they became a large and fairly young and vigorous workforce. Those people became the factory workers, which enabled the United States to become the manufacturing hub for the Western world. That was a good thing. Now, in dealing with our current situation, you know, we really can't have Congress pass a policy that's gonna stop wages from rising. Uh, <laughs> they would all be thrown out of office if they did. And furthermore, uh, there's no national policy that's going to stop the price of technology from declining. And we definitely should never do that. We want the cost of those goods to keep going down. But there's one very important factor that depends totally on national policy. This is something we can and should control. That is that robots don't pay taxes. Look at the corner on uh, the picture on the right. The robot arm and the woman together are producing some necessary product. The woman earns wages from which are deducted income taxes, social security taxes, uh, and her employer on top of that pays additional social security taxes, pays unemployment taxes, pays workman comp taxes, and most importantly, has to pay medical benefits. The robot arm doesn't need any of that. And furthermore, there are tax incentives for buying the robot arm. Now, when someone is preparing a contract proposing to, to give uh, uh, workers to a corporation or to a government agency, they have to prepare a, contact, a contract that contains what they call fully burdened costs. That is all the costs associated with the worker, not just their wages. The real cost of an employee 
is often 50% more than the gross wages that they earn. This graph uh, was prepared for a particular segment of the economy, but it's representative of most of the US economy. Uh, the wages paid are the largest part of the cost of an employee, but by no means the whole part. All those other taxes and benefits really add up. In fact, often the cost of an employee is double what the employee takes home. But there's no tax on robots. And as I said, there are tax incentives to buy them. They're called investment credits. Another reason that robots should pay taxes is the social security crisis. Now you may recall if you uh, attended my demographics lecture that the number of, a number of current workers supporting retirees has declined dramatically since World War II. Now I should make the uh, perhaps unpopular point, social security is not really an insurance program. If it were an insurance program, people would have to pay premiums, an insurance company would have to earn money on those premiums and eventually would pay out some benefits. That's not the way social security works. The money that I receive and perhaps you receive every month from social security administration doesn't come from earnings on the social security taxes that I paid during my career. It comes from taxes levied on current workers. In effect, every retiree is being supported by a number of current workers who are paying social security taxes. And as you can see, the number of workers supporting every retiree has been declining every year. This particular graph ends in the year 2010. That's before most of the boomers retired. So this is a real problem. If only human workers are supporting retirees, our declining population and the increasing ratio of older people to younger people, that's called the age dependency ratio, is gonna make this problem continually worse into the foreseeable future. But if robots and human workers both support social security recipients, a declining number of human workers can be offset by an increasing number of robots or other forms of automation. This is a graph showing uh, gross domestic product. Now, in other words, the total goods and services produced in the country per retiree. And you'll notice that from 1960 through 2020, uh, the curve goes up and down a little bit, but the general trend is up. In other words, our economy is producing more goods and services per retiree almost every year. So look at the two together. If we only support retirees with taxes on current workers, we've got a declining curve. But if we support them with all of the goods and services produced in the country, we have an increasing curve. <laughs> As a retiree, I know which one I prefer. Robots don't pay taxes, but human workers and their machines produced all the goods and services needed to support retirees as of 2010, and indeed as of 2020. Now, there was a slight decline in 2020 uh, due to increased retirees and some economic headwinds, but the trend is very clear. This has produced a very lively current debate. Uh, this is a picture of a New York Times article from um, February of 2019 in which a, a well-respected economics writer said it's time to tax the robots. And in fact, Bill Gates is the first one to have made that public pronouncement quite a few years before that. Now, there are a number of advantages to taxing robots. The first one being that government needs income taxes, social security taxes, and et cetera. Automation cuts tax revenue. Every time you replace a human worker with a machine, government revenue goes down. Tax incentives, in fact, encourage replacing humans with machines. 
if there were a tax on the machines, on the robots, this would reduce the incentive to fire people and buy machines. It wouldn't eliminate it perhaps, but it would reduce the incentive. And so it would slow the rate at which humans are replaced by robots. Now, displaced workers increase the need for government spending. They need to receive unemployment benefits. They need retraining. Uh, but tax collections go down when that worker is displaced. So slowing the automation will make it more manageable. And by having a tax on the robots, it will also make it more affordable. Now, there are some disadvantages to trying to tax robots. In fact, here is an article from just last year in which an economist tried to make the case against taxing robots. The cons are basically this. They claim automation increases productivity. So if you slow down automation, you're slowing down economic growth. And economic growth is the holy grail that all government policymakers are pursuing because economic growth means everyone is better off. Also, some critical industries depend much more on automation than others. Uh, anyone who's been looking at the car market lately knows that there is a severe shortage of chips to go into new cars. As a result, the number of new cars available is reduced and therefore the price of used cars has gone up. Well, chip manufacturing is almost totally an automated process. To build a new chip fabrication plant costs well over uh, $2 billion. And almost all of that cost is for very expensive, highly precise machines. There are human employees, but they are frankly, not very important part of the cost. Another problem is how do you define a robot? Or more importantly, how do you define it in a way that clever tax lawyers can't game the system? After all, those people get paid for finding loopholes and they're pretty good at their job. Finally, uh, some people say, hey, the robot apocalypse hasn't happened yet. Are we just being Luddites? Are we just one more example of people being afraid of automation when in fact automation is going to provide everybody with more income and better jobs? Well, in my opinion, the really important issue is how do you define a robot in a way that doesn't lead to gaming the system? If that problem can be solved, a lot of the others can be solved. I have a modest proposal, a way to do this, and it's called a value added tax. A value added tax or a VAT is a tax where a producer adds value to a product by whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, a producer combines or processes inputs and they produce outputs that they then sell. Um, almost any business that you can think of is basically a producer by this definition. Um, if you are making um, parts for the auto industry, you buy steel, you buy plastic, you buy uh, wire, and you make some subcomponent with both humans and machines. And then you sell that component to an automaker. If there were a 5% value added tax, a producer's tax would be 5% of the sale price of its outputs minus the tax that was paid on its inputs. In other words, if you're making parts for the auto industry, um, when you sell that part, there is a 5% tax on the sale price minus whatever was the value added tax that was paid on the ingredients that you're using to make that part. Now, the big thing is that whether the part is being produced by humans, by robots, by software, lab rats, it doesn't matter. Replacing workers with automation does not decrease the tax revenue because the value added tax is on the value of the output, not on how you made it. The tax is not added onto the sale price, it's built into the sale price. So it's not something that is explicitly visible, but 
it does represent a slight increase in the price. Now, someone who's an extractor of resources from the earth, like a miner, uh, or any producer with no inputs, like say a tax lawyer, pays the tax on the total sale price of their output. Now, as a modest measured beginning, I would propose using a VAT to replace the social security taxes which, as you know, are 6.2% on the employee and another 6.2% on the employer. So both the employee and the employer benefit when that social security tax is replaced. Now, admittedly, in heavily automated industries like building cars or making computer chips, uh, they're going to be more severely affected because they already are very highly automated. So there would need to be some transition rules to soften the impact and stretch it out over a few years so that there's not a sudden shock to their industry. But nonetheless, after a transition period, every industry should be paying a value added tax instead of social security taxes. Now, this would reduce the disincentives to hire humans and the tax advantage of robots would be decreased because you no longer have to pay 12.4% of the employee's wages to the government. That means that your costs are reduced for hiring people. Furthermore, if the output of your robots is gonna produce just as much value added tax as the output of your human workers, the human workers maybe look a little bit more attractive. And here's the important point. There's no definition required of a robot. A VAT would apply to all industries, including services. Uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of automation they're doing. Value added by a Wall Street software program is also taxed. Any non-human component of the production is taxed just like the humans because the tax is on the value of the output. It's not on how you made the output. Now, optionally, um, people who are concerned that Social Security is in some long-term financial problems, you could make the VAT, rut, VAT rate high enough that it would eliminate the Social Security financial crisis. Uh, that would be a pretty attractive uh, single blow that could solve several problems at once. Now. Does anybody know who that person is? That's Debbie Stabenow, and she's our senator who happens to be on the Senate Finance Committee. I think that if a well-researched and well-presented proposal were given to her staff, Senator Stabenow might consider sponsoring a bill to try this. Anybody want to help? If you do, that's my email address, and I would welcome an email from anyone who says, I'd like to help put together a proposal for a value-added tax to replace the Social Security tax. Now, during the live presentation last week, we had a question and answer time, and obviously uh, you folks cannot ask any questions because this is being recorded, but please notice my email address is still there. Okay, another type of issues are social issues facing artificial intelligence. And one that I'm sure every parent has on their mind is, is AI really promoting social isolation? Well, any parent seeing this picture would probably say, if AI has anything to do with cell phones, yes, it is. Uh, certainly AI as a part of life online, and believe me, it is part more and more of our lives online. AI has replaced face-to-face -face human contact for a lot of things. For finding facts, if you wanna know, you just Google it. For finding friends, um, you can be part of any number of online groups that will put you in contact with people that may indeed become friends, but they're distant friends. AI through online means allows for sharing life events and personal news. 
uh, through Facebook and a lot of things like Facebook. Uh, online life provides entertainment that used to be something that only humans could provide for other humans. And there are probably lots of other examples that you can think of. But there's another side to the story. AI also can provide companionship and support for people who need it, specifically for the elderly. Uh, Japan has been a leader in trying to create robots and other devices that can provide companionship and support, uh, and indeed sometimes um, medical support to the elderly. Now, I'm not sure whether that robot really is smart enough to play cards, but the idea that a robot can provide things that normally a caregiver would provide solves a real problem because there's a shortage of caregivers. And that shortage directly impacts the quality of life for nursing home and homebound seniors. Um, I'm 77 years old. This is an issue that uh, resonates with me. I would be happy to have a robot in my home if it can help me to remember when to take my meds, if it can uh, call for assistance, if I should uh, fall or become ill, uh, even if it can hand me a towel in the shower, I would go for that. And as I said, Japan is the pioneer in this area. And many of the robots that are currently uh, providing care to the elderly uh, are being designed and built in Japan. Another issue is the use of AI in our military. Now, some people say that AI is a threat when it's used by the military, a threat to all of civilization. And they have some arguments. They say that drone strikes kill innocent civilians. Anybody that reads the newspaper would have a hard time arguing against that. And smart missiles, so-called, attacking in numbers can easily destroy a well-defended facility or indeed an entire city. And they can do this even though there might be heavy losses of those missiles because no pilots will lose their lives in that attack. Uh, cyber bombs, that is uh, digital attacks against the computer infrastructure of a company. Cyber bombs can destroy electrical grids. They can destroy phone networks. They can wipe out internet assets. They can do tremendous amounts of damage. Now, so far, we're not aware that any one nation has used a cyber bomb against another as part of a war, but do you recognize the term Stuxnet? Uh, for a long time, uh, no one would take credit for having created Stuxnet. That was a virus, a computer virus, that somehow got onto all the centrifuge machines that Iraq was using to refine nuclear fuel for their nuclear weapons program. The virus got onto all the machines and then at a certain moment, every centrifuge destroyed itself. Some have estimated that that cyber bomb put back their nuclear weapons program by several years, perhaps as much as five years. Now, it is rumored that the Israeli uh, version of the CIA plus our own CIA produced Stuxnet. It was not used as part of a war, but it was used to um, reduce the weapons capability of a potential enemy nation. But some people say, no, AI in the military really is a good thing because a lot of American soldiers were injured or killed when driving convoys simply delivering supplies to frontline troops. Improvised explosive devices, IEDs, uh, destroyed a lot of trucks and their drivers. But if those trucks are being driven autonomously or remotely, uh, no humans will lose their lives if they run into an IED. Uh, furthermore, uh, some American companies have produced drones that are called scout drones. They are these little um, four rotor 
uh, drones that you've perhaps seen taking pictures. You can buy one for less than $1,000. Well, these are scout drones that can stay up in the air for 30 to 60 minutes. They're small enough, they'll fit in the backpack that the soldier carries. But if the soldier is in a situation where they really need to know what's out there in the uh, battlefield in front of them, uh, they can simply launch that drone with its cameras and sensors and without exposing anyone to fire, they can get a good picture of the battlefield. So is AI a threat to civilization when it's used by the military? Well, you decide. Story time. This is not directly related, but it's one of my favorite stories. Back in the mid eighties, I was at the University of Pennsylvania studying AI. And uh, Penn at that time was very big in the area of natural language processing. They were, uh, had some of the best researchers in the world. The army gave a contract to Penn to try to develop a system to, to allow voice control of a tank. Now remember, this was the 80s, you know, decades before Alexa was ever even thought of. Um, Penn studied the problem. They understood the, the potential advantages because normally a tank crew was three people. There was the tank commander who stood up and looked out through the turret, but then there was a tank driver who was down inside who simply did what the uh, tank commander told him to, and there was also a gunner. But if they could allow the tank commander to control the tank with his voice, this could eliminate one third of the tank crew. So Penn studied the problem very carefully, came up with a really good solution, they thought. They gave it to the army and they showed up for a field trial where a bunch of tanks were going to use this new system. And it was a miserable failure. They studied all the tapes and all the records of what happened, <laughs> and they came up with a solution. They took every curse word and crudity they could think of and translated that to stop the tank. It worked much better that way. Another social issue facing artificial intelligence is the whole question of whether an AI can have rights. Well, we have to first say, is there any precedent? Do non-human entities already have rights in US law? Absolutely. Corporations are non-human. They have rights and duties. Partnerships, the same thing. Limited liability corporations, which perhaps a lot of you are, are involved with. All entities that pay US taxes have rights and responsibilities. They're not AIs, but they are non-human entities. Now, I'm not talking about a VAT here, but if robots ever had to pay taxes directly, if a robot were ever responsible for directly paying a tax, under US tax law, they would have responsibilities. They would also have some rights. Now, what about the case where an AI is just the agent of a human? Can it inherit the human's rights? Well, in parts of US law, absolutely. For instance, the stock market. Most stock trades these days are not made directly by a human. They're made by a computer that is owned and operated by a human, but the computer can move much more quickly than any human could. Now, while that computer, that AI system is making trades and making decisions about what to do in the market, it has the same rights and responsibilities as the person that owns it. So can an AI have rights? Well, maybe. In the distant future, and I mean really distant, robots could be the equivalent of slaves in ancient cultures, or maybe slaves in 19th century United States. Could they have rights? Well, how did the slave situation work out? If you're really interested in this philosophical issue, I'd like to recommend a British television series to you. It's called Humans. Uh, season three, I think, began uh, last fall. But uh, this is a rather extensive 
television series that explores totally the issue of what if robots become conscious? In this picture, uh, the person on the far left and the far right is a human. The three in the middle are conscious, self-aware robots. They, quote, woke up. And the whole series is about how would human society respond to that? Would they be willing to give these sentient robots rights? Would they, would they be willing to treat them as another intelligent species? It's a difficult philosophical problem. This show, I think, explores that issue better than any that I have seen. You can uh, find it on, uh, I think it's on Amazon Prime and probably from some other sources. Finally, I guess as a social issue, could a robot apocalypse really happen? Well, you see that term every once in a while in the, the news, but there's not really an agreed definition of what they mean by robot apocalypse. One definition is where AI or robots are self-sufficient and effectively take control of the earth. Uh, that's popular with science fiction and writers and, and movie makers. Um, some say, no, a robot apocalypse is simply when industries employ mostly robots and we're gonna to have to provide universal basic income to deal with millions of displaced workers. That's an economic definition. Um, a third definition uh, has been proposed. An apocalypse would be where robots are trained to eradicate harmful invasive species like Dutch elm disease. And then they decide that humans are an invasive species. Well, please note that both the first and the third definition have a couple of prerequisites. They can't happen unless robots are self-aware and not under human control. And they require that robots lack a moral or ethical scheme like Asimov's three laws. Now, anyone who's a science fiction buff and maybe just a scientist knows about Asimov's three laws. Isaac Asimov was a science fiction writer starting in 1957 because he was afraid when Sputnik went up that Russia might win the Cold War. But before that, he was a uh, biochemistry professor at an Ivy League college. He was a good scientist. And as he was thinking about robots in the future, he re realized that some kind of an ethical scheme was gonna be necessary if robots were going to be as wonderfully creative and powerful as he envisioned them. So he came up with three laws that he said would solve this problem. The first law was that a robot can't harm a human or stand by and let a human uh, come to harm. The second law was that a robot can protect itself unless it conflicts with the first law. So a robot could sacrifice itself in order to protect a human. And the third law is that a robot has to obey a human unless this conflicts with the first or the second law. This was such a well thought out scheme that for decades, both science fiction writers and those who were working in artificial intelligence said, yep, he nailed it. This is what we need to program someday uh, to make ethical robots. But Asimov himself, about 25 years after his first robot story, discovered that there was a flaw. He said there has to be a zeroth law that takes precedent over the other three laws. That law is that a robot may not harm humankind or through inaction allow humankind to be harmed. And then the first law that a robot can't harm a human can be overridden if that would conflict with the zeroth law. So in other words, Asimov realized that there might be occasions when a robot would need to harm a human in order to save humankind. Um, is this the, the last word on robot ethics? Well, we don't know. My take, and it's worth exactly what you're paying for it, is that self-awareness in an AI is extremely difficult to achieve. Now, there are many academics 
that claim it's impossible. And I tend to be in that camp. As AIs and robots become more capable of independent decisions, more and more there will be stress placed on ethical constraints. The time will come when in fact Asimov's four laws will in fact be built into robots. Non-military AIs will be designed to be safe. After all, <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein's experience has been duly noted. The robot apocalypse requires also massive numbers of rogue robots throughout society. And in my opinion, that's not likely, certainly not for many, many decades. Now, that second definition saying that a, an apocalypse has occurred simply when robots have displaced humans in most industries and we need something like universal basic income. Well, that's an idea that's well before its time. See my prior argument. And besides, if the pace of automation is slow enough, human displacement is not a problem, it's a feature. Universal basic income, as you may recall, was the sole platform of one of the 2020 presidential candidates, and he did not get much attraction uh, at all. This idea is way premature. There are a couple of local jurisdictions, one of them in Oregon and another one, I forget where, that have actually done experiments with universal basic income. And there are some claims that it has some value, but we are decades away from any scheme like that ever being needed, let alone tried. Now, really, universal basic income isn't a technology issue at all. It's an economic policy issue. And what it's dealing with is not robots, it's dealing with income inequality. So I would argue, um, erase this from your concerns about a technical robot apocalypse. Again, last week we paused for questions and comments here. Um, and I would like to repeat one of the comments that was given uh, on the issue of social isolation. Bill Wells was here in the classroom and he said, you know, that picture of the teenagers all staring at their phones is just the modern version. But he said, before we had cell phones, we had the printing press. And people used to sit with their nose buried in a book. People used to use newspapers and books to find information instead of asking a human. People used to get their entertainment, not by sitting around the campfire with their family or their village, but by reading a book. So he argued that we have simply automated books, if you will, and that the problem of social isolation is not a new one. And I thought Bill made a good point. Finally, there's the issue of legal issues. Uh, and the big one, a current one, is whether or not artificial intelligence research should be regulated. Now, those who think so argue that AI is a growing, powerful, vital part of our society. AI is everywhere. Now, there are other powerful forces in our society and we regulate them. Monopolies, energy companies, drug companies. Uh, we certainly have regulated uh, research into cloning. So if AI is a powerful new technology, why shouldn't we regulate it like all the others? Also, they argue that AIs may be built with inherent biases or with socially unacceptable goals or dangerous capabilities. Now you'll recall in previous lectures, we've talked about this problem that in order to build an AI using neural nets or deep learning, you have to have not only a huge neural net with billions of parameters, but you also have to show it millions of examples that it can learn from. Well, where do you find millions of examples of anything these days? You find it on the internet. That data is free. And that's the price that most academics really like. But what's on the internet came from us, came from people. And it contains all the biases, all the prejudices, all the conspiracy theories, all the misconceptions. It is not only all of human wisdom, but it's also all of human folly. So. If AIs are built with neural nets that have been trained 
with all that data, they're going to be biased. They may very well um, believe in some sense in um, conspiracy theories. So that's an argument for saying that we really should regulate AI research to try to constrain that problem. And the final argument, I think, is that they say, hey, researchers focus on what can be done, but it's regulators that focus on what should be done. So we need regulators to provide that element of our research programs. Others argue that no, AI research should not be regulated. And their best argument, in my opinion, is who do we trust to be the regulator? Are we gonna say that each state can regulate it? Or only the US government? Or maybe international treaties? Perhaps a committee of the United Nations? Or, <laughs> this one scares me, an industry committee? You can't have a regulation unless you have a regulator. And picking the regulator of AI research is indeed a deep problem. Furthermore, if the United States restricts AI research, but our adversaries don't, isn't this unilateral disarmament? Aren't we deliberately taking away from ourselves a potential weapon in the economic and possibly even military wars among nations? And finally, they argue that, hey, researchers produce knowledge and societies as a whole can decide how to use knowledge once it exists. If it doesn't exist, we can't make the decisions. So the argument is, let the researchers produce the knowledge, then raise the questions about how that knowledge should be used. I think my personal feeling is that the best argument against regulating AI research is, how can you enforce a ban on thinking, on experimenting, especially when it's done by private entities? Um, I think it's just unworkable, in my opinion. Another legal issue is, can you sue a robot? As you can see from this NPR article, um, recently a Tesla driver was involved in a crash. Two people were killed and the courts decided that the driver should be charged with involuntary manslaughter, not Tesla, the company. That's an important legal precedent, but will that precedent hold? To date, no one has tried to sue a Roomba, uh, not even its manufacturer, iRobot. But an autonomous vehicle, well, that's a robot when it's driving without a human behind the wheel. And cars with certified level five autonomy can legally do so. Now, in, within strict limits in the city of Phoenix, that's already happening. In the rest of the United States, there are no uh, level five autonomy certified cars yet, but it's gonna happen someday. In thinking ahead to this problem, the people who are trying to develop the software for an autonomous vehicle uh, frequently refer to what's called the trolley dilemma. This is a, a favorite of philosophers. Imagine that you are on a trolley in San Francisco and you are the person who is the, the driver, if you will. You have the control in your hand. You're going along at a pretty good speed and all of a sudden ahead of you, you see that on the track, there is a crowd of people around someone who has fallen. It includes a family of five uh, around an elderly person. If you continue straight ahead, you're going to hit that whole crowd and multiple people are going to be injured if not killed. However, there is a turn in the tracks just before you get there. If you turn, if you pull the lever, you can turn that trolley so that it takes the right turn and will run over two people who are standing on the tracks at the turn. So the dilemma is. If you take no action, many more than two people are gonna be injured or killed. And how can you be sued for not doing anything? After all, the trolley was going down the track. On the other hand, if you move the lever and turn the trolley, you have taken an action that deliberately 
injures or kills two people. Can you be sued for that action? Uh, this is a serious dilemma. Now, it's just a thought experiment when we talk about you running a trolley. But if you are the software engineer who is trying to write rules for an autonomous vehicle to follow when it detects humans ahead, you have to take this seriously. Another problem is what is called the 90% conundrum. It has been estimated that if all human drivers were replaced by properly functioning autonomous vehicles, 90% of all highway fatalities would be eliminated. That's because 90% of all fatalities currently are attributed completely or in part to human error. Autonomous vehicles can save 90% of the 50,000 Americans that die every year on our highways. Well, saving 45,000 lives is a really important goal. But the problem is that those 45,000 people will never know that their lives were saved. They won't know about the accident that did not happen. But the remaining 5% who were killed by an autonomous vehicle in a situation that the vehicle could not avoid, they will know about the accident they were involved in. And there are ambulance chasers out there that will be dying to sue someone like Google or Tesla. How can we prevent that danger from stopping something that could save 45,000 lives? This is a legal problem. If a Tesla kills a pedestrian, do you sue Tesla? Do you sue the owner of the car? Do you sue the driver of the car? Do you sue the, do you sue the state that gave the level five certification to that car? Do you, sue, do you sue the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration? A lawyer is gonna have a choice of many, many targets. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm not sure that they're always gonna make the choice that is in the best interest of society. I would like to point out that it's not just autonomous vehicles. Remember the 737 MAX that was grounded for over two years because its autopilot made decisions that caused two planes to go down and kill all their passengers? And there was an accident just this week in which a 737 took an unexpected dive and um, a whole plane load of people were killed. That's not the only example. Uh, there are search and rescue robots that exist right now that can be sent into an area that is too dangerous for a human crew. For instance, uh, in a nuclear disaster, such as uh, the Fukushima uh, reactor in Japan that was hit by a tsunami, um, a mine explosion where there are toxic fumes there that would quickly overwhelm any human that went down. A robot can go into that mine or can go into that uh, nuclear area and perform search and rescue, but it has to make decisions. It has to decide when it comes to an individual who is perhaps trapped under some rubble, is it able to save that individual or should it go on looking for someone else that is easier to extract and take out? If that search and rescue robot decides not to save your family member, can you sue the robot? Can you sue the robot owner? Um, then there are medical AIs. As you saw last week, there are AIs that are better than humans at interpreting MRIs, interpreting ultrasounds, interpreting uh, looking at uh, PET CT scans. And more and more, we're going to be relying on those. Well, what if an AI interprets your uh, mammogram and misses a small tumor. And the next time you go in for a mammogram, that tumor has grown larger and has metastasized. Can you sue the medical AI for quote, malpractice? Can you sue it for its mistake? These are, are serious issues and they're issues that are going to come up. Oops. Now I think that this is analogous to a problem that America faced back in the 19th century. That was industrial accidents. If you'll think back to uh, around the year 1800, 1820, 
there was something going on in America that was um, tremendously powerful. Steam power and later electric power was being used in factories to power very big, very powerful machines that could do things that human workers couldn't do before. American factories using steam and electricity could produce goods that the rest of the world envied. The US became a very rich nation because of our growing industrial prowess. But there was a problem. These big machines could not only stamp metal parts and do other things, uh, if there were an accident, they could maim or kill a human worker. Now, lawmakers and policymakers at the time realized that they didn't want to ban these industrial machines because they were the source of America's wealth. But on the other hand, if a factory owner could be sued for who knows how much money every time a worker was injured or killed, the factory workers, the factory owners would probably decide not to use the equipment and not to create more wealth for America. The solution that Congress came up with, which I thought was a pretty sensible one, was something called workman's compensation. We still have that law in effect, but it was most useful back in the 19th century when industrial accidents were more common. The law said that if you are injured in an industrial accident, you cannot sue the factory owner. You cannot sue the manufacturer of that machine. You can only ask for compensation from the workman's compensation fund. And there was a formula. If you lose a hand, you get this much money. If you lose your whole arm, you get a, a different amount. If someone is killed, the family receives a set amount no lawyers involved. This allowed the spread of a technology that occasionally cost human lives, but it removed the danger of being uh, sued out of existence for someone who chose to use that technology. Something equivalent to workman's comp might be necessary to deal with those who are injured by autonomous vehicles. This is an issue that, to my knowledge, no lawmakers or policymakers have yet dealt with, but it is a real issue. Finally, um, there's the question of whether artificial general intelligence is possible. By that, I mean a robot or a machine that has so much knowledge about so much in life that it's kind of like data in the TV show Star Trek Next Generation a robot that can handle almost any situation that a human can handle. Obviously that does not exist. Some would argue it will not exist for many, many years, but it's a legal issue. Some researchers are pursuing artificial general intelligence, sort of, but right now it's a very fuzzy research area. Most researchers, claim that artificial general intelligence is not really possible for decades, if ever. Um, AGI doesn't require self-awareness, but it could include it, in which case you would have not only a generally intelligent, but also a self-aware conscious robot. Now, 100% of current AIs are what we call brittle. By that, we mean that if you build a system that can beat the world's champion Go player, yay, you've built a really smart AI. That machine doesn't know how to play checkers. That machine doesn't know how to play chess. It doesn't even know how to play tic-tac-toe. As soon as you move the slightest bit away from the area in which the AI is an expert, it becomes an idiot. Um, People in the field call that the brittleness of AI systems, meaning that they're great until some little thing violates their assumptions and then they just destroy themselves. Now, neural nets, or deep learning as it's sometimes called, are performing very well in many AI fields. And the problem is each net is trained for a narrow range of tasks the training is determined by the examples that it is fed. Now, so far, 
The broadest application of neural nets is this GPT-3 that we've been talking about. But even that amazingly capable program can only generate stories or computer code or photos at the moment. Whether or not other areas can be attacked using that architecture remains to be seen. Um, I said at the moment, predicting how much uh, additional capability that system can acquire is really a difficult task. This is a brand new kind of neural net. And that architecture is now being applied to lots of other AI subfields uh, in an, on an experimental basis. So far, it shows great promise, but we haven't really seen a breakthrough outside that narrow area so far. Now, if a general architecture truly develops, maybe based on this GPT-3 or maybe based on something else, that would strengthen the arguments of those who believe that artificial general intelligence is possible. In fact, some researchers have said, what we need to do is to build an AI infant and then let it learn. After all, that's how humans become smart. Um, an infant doesn't know much, but it is the most amazing learning machine the world has ever seen. But there's a problem. Babies learn from just a few examples or just a few experiences, but neural nets require millions or sometimes billions of examples. Um, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to build an AI infant in that sense. Furthermore, babies have millions of nerve endings and they have five senses. Robots? Mm -hmm. No. Also, children generalize across tasks. When children pick up a skill, they are often able to transfer that skill to other tasks or other environments. And we adults often reason by analogy, but most AIs can't generalize at all. They are brittle. So building an AI infant isn't really gonna be the solution in that sense. Even more, emotions are involved in all childhood development. If you've ever watched a youngster grow up, you know that emotions are a key element in what they learn to like, what they learn to fear, what they learn to enjoy. Well, today, robots don't have emotions. My personal belief, worth exactly what you're paying for it, is that artificial general intelligence is not possible for many, many decades, if ever. However, those making predictions about the future should be modest. On that same day, So I will make my predictions with perhaps just a touch of humility. So at the end of last week's class, we had a final question and answer period, which unfortunately we cannot duplicate here. Uh, I don't remember any of the um, questions that were asked, so I'm unfortunately not able to uh, give you any part of that. But we certainly did raise a lot of issues today. And what is important is, what do you think? Now, you can't raise a question in this class, but I've given you my email address, and you can always back up to it. Um, I would be very interested to hear what you have to say about any of these issues. And if some really good points are made, I think we have the ability to uh, circulate that conversation to those who have received this video. So. I invite you to think about these things and please feel free to push back at some of my conclusions or my assertions or to comment on these areas. We'd like to hear from you. The end. Gary, thank you very much on behalf of everyone at HASP and especially for those people who are disappointed that they were unable to hear your original presentation. We just appreciate your contributions and we appreciate you 
stepping up to make this available so that people can watch it. It's incredibly interesting, informative, and we appreciate all that you do. With that, I'm going to close the class. Everybody enjoy their day.